Hi, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. Today we're reading from Black Beauty, starting with Chapter 30, A Thief. My new master was an unmarried man. He lived at Bath and was engaged in business. His doctor advised him to take horse exercise, and for this purpose he bought me. He hired a stable a short distance from his lodgings and engaged a man named Filcher as groom. My master knew very little about horses, but he treated me well, and I should have had a good and easy place, but for circumstances of which he was ignorant. He ordered the best hay with plenty of oats, crushed beans and bran with vetches or ryegrass, as the man might think needful. I heard the master give the order, so I knew there was plenty of good food, and I thought I was well off. For a few days, all went on well. I found that my groom understood his business. He kept the stable clean and airy, and he groomed me thoroughly, and was never otherwise than gentle. He had been a hostler in one of the great hotels in Bath. He had given that up and now cultivated fruit and vegetables for the market, and his wife bred and fattened poultry and rabbits for sale. After a while, it seemed to me that my oats came very short. I had the beans, but bran was mixed with them instead of oats, of which there were very few, certainly not more than a quarter of what there should have been. In two or three weeks, this began to tell upon my strength and spirits. The grass food, though very good, was not the thing to keep up my condition without corn. However, I could not complain nor make known my wants. So it went on for about two months, and I wondered my master did not see that something was the matter. However, one afternoon he rode out into the country to see a friend of his, a gentleman farmer, who lived on the road to Wells. This gentleman had a very quick eye for horses, and after he had welcomed his friend, he said, casting his eye over me, It seems to me, Barry, that your horse does not look so well as he did when you first had him. Has he been well? Yes, said my master, but he is not nearly so lively as he was. My groom tells me that horses are always dull and weak in the autumn, and that I must expect it. Autumn fiddlesticks, said the farmer. Why, this is only August. And with your light work and good food, he ought not to go down like this, even if it was autumn. How do you feed him? My master told him. The other shook his head slowly and began to feel me over. I can't say who eats your corn, my dear fellow, but I am much mistaken if your horse gets it. Have you ridden fast? No, very gently. Then just put your hand here, said he, passing his hand over my neck and shoulder. He is as warm and damp as a horse just come up from grass. I advise you to look into your stable a little more. I hate to be suspicious, and thank heaven I have no cause to be, for I can trust my men, present or absent. But there are mean scoundrels, wicked enough to rob a dumb beast of his food. You must look into it. And turning to the man who had come to take me, said, Give this horse a right good feed of bruised oats and don't stint him. Dumb beasts, yes we are, but if I could have spoken, I could have told my master where his oats went to. My groom used to come every morning about six o'clock, and with him a little boy who always had a covered basket with him. He used to go with his father into the harness room where the corn was kept, and I could see them when the door stood ajar, fill a little bag with oats out of the bin, and then he used to be off. Five or six mornings after this, just as the boy had left the stable, a policeman walked in, holding the child tight by the arm. Another followed and locked the door on the inside, saying, Show me the place where your father keeps his rabbit's food. The boy looked very frightened and began to cry, but there was no escape, and he led the way to the corn bin. Here the policeman found another empty bag, like that which was found full of oats in the boy's basket. Filcher was cleaning my feet at the time, but they soon saw him, and though he blustered a good deal, they walked him off to the lockup and his boy with him. I heard afterwards that the boy was not held to be guilty, but the man was sentenced to prison for two months. Chapter 31. A Humbug. My master was not immediately suited, but in a few days my new groom came. He was a tall, good-looking fellow enough, but if ever there was a humbug in the shape of a groom, Alfred Smirk was the man. He was very civil to me and never used me ill. In fact, he did a great deal of stroking and patting when his master was there to see it. He always brushed my mane and tail with water and my hoofs with oil before he brought me to the door to make me look smart. But as to cleaning my feet or looking to my shoes or grooming me thoroughly, he thought no more of that than if I had been a cow. He left my bit rusty, my saddle damp, and my crupper stiff. Alfred Smirk considered himself very handsome. He spent a great deal of time about his hair, whiskers, and necktie before a little looking glass in the harness room. When his master was speaking to him, it was always... Yes, sir. 
yes, sir, touching his hat at every word, and everyone thought he was a very nice young man, and that Mr. Barry was very fortunate to meet with him. I should say he was the laziest, most conceited fellow I ever came near. Of course, it was a great thing not to be ill-used, but then a horse wants more than that. I had a loose box and might have been very comfortable if he had not been too indolent to clean it out. He never took all the straw away, and the smell from what lay underneath was very bad. While the strong vapors that rose made my eyes smart, and I did not feel the same appetite for my food. One day his master came in and said, Alfred, the stable smells rather strong. Should not you give that stall a good scrub and throw down plenty of water? Well, sir, he said, touching his cap, I'll do so if you please, sir. But it is rather dangerous, sir, throwing down water in a horse's box. They are very apt to take hold, sir. I should not like... I should not like to do him an injury, but I'll do it if you please, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, said his master, I should not like him to take cold, but I don't like the smell of the stable. Do you think the drains are all right? Well, sir, now you mention it, I think the drain does sometimes send back a smell. There may be something wrong, sir. Then send for the bricklayer and have it seen to, said his master. Yes, sir, I will. The bricklayer came and pulled up a great many bricks, but found nothing amiss. So he put down some lime and charged the master five shillings, and the smell in my box was as bad as ever. But that was not all. Standing as I did on a quantity of moist straw, my feet grew unhealthy and tender, and the master used to say, I don't know what is the matter with this horse. He goes very fumble-footed. I am sometimes afraid he will stumble. Yes, sir, said Alfred. I have noticed the same myself when I have exercised him. Now the fact was that he hardly ever did exercise me, and when the master was busy, I often stood for days together without stretching my legs at all, and yet being fed just as high as if I were at hard work. This often disordered my health and made me sometimes heavy and dull, but more often restless and feverish. He never gave me a meal of green food or a bran mash which would have cooled me, for he was altogether as ignorant as he was conceited. And then, instead of exercise or change of food, I had to take horse balls and draughts, which besides the nuisance, nuisance of having them poured down my throat, used to make me feel ill and uncomfortable. One day, my feet were so tender that trotting over some fresh stones with my master on my back, I had two such serious stumbles that as he came down Lansdowne into the city, he stopped at the farriers and asked him to see what was the matter with me. The man took up my feet one by one and examined them. Then standing up and dusting his hands one against the other, he said, your horse has got the thrush, and badly, too. His feet are very tender. It is fortunate that he has not been down. I wonder your groom has not seen to it before. This is the sort of thing we find in foul stables, where the, where the litter is never properly cleaned out. If you will send him here tomorrow, I will attend to the hoof, and I will direct your man how to apply the liniment which I will give him. The next day I had my feet thoroughly cleansed and stuffed with, with tow soaked in some strong lotion, and a very unpleasant business it was. The farrier ordered all the litter to be taken out of my box day by day, and the floor kept very clean. Then I was to have bran mashes, a little green food, and not so much corn, till my feet were well again. With this treatment I soon regained my spirits, but Mr. Barry was so much disgusted at being twice deceived by his grooms that he determined to give up keeping a horse and to hire when he wanted one. I was therefore kept till my feet were quite well and was then sold again. Part 3, Chapter 32, A Horse Fair No doubt a horse fair is a very amusing place to those who have nothing to lose. At any rate, there is plenty to see. Long strings of young horses out of the country, fresh from the marshes, and droves of shaggy little Welsh ponies, no higher than merry legs, and hundreds of cart horses of all sorts, some of them with their long tails braided up and tied with scarlet cord, and a good many like myself, handsome and high-bred, but fallen into the middle class through some accident or blemish, unsoundness of wind, or some other complaint. There were some splendid animals, quite in their prime and fit for anything. They were throwing out their legs and showing off their paces in high style as they were trotted out with a leading rein, the groom running by their side. But round in the background there were a number of poor things, sadly broken down with hard work, with their knees knuckling over and their hind legs swinging out at every step, and there were some very dejected-looking old horses with the underlip hanging down and the ears lying back heavily, as if there were no more pleasure in life and no more, no more hope. 
There were some so thin you might see all their ribs and some with old sores on their backs and hips. These were sad sights for a horse to look upon. Who knows not but that he may come to the same state. There was a great deal of bargaining, of, of running up and beating down, and if a horse may speak his mind so far as he understands, I should say there were more lies told and more trickery at that horse fair than a clever man could give an account of. I was put with two or three other strong, useful-looking horses, and a good many people came to look at us. The gentlemen always turned from me when they saw my broken knees, though the man who had me swore it was only a slip in the stall. The first thing was to pull my mouth open, then to look at my eyes, then feel all the way down my legs and give me a hard feel of the skin and flesh, and then try my paces. It was wonderful what a difference there was in the way these things were done. Some did it in a rough, offhand way, as if one was only a piece of wood, while others would move their hands gently over one's body with a pat now and then, as much as to say, by your leave. Of course, I judged a good deal of the buyers by their manners to myself. There was one man that made me think that if he would buy me, I should be happy. He was not a gentleman, nor yet one of the loud, flashy short sort that called themselves so. He was rather a small man, but well-made and quick in all his motions. I knew in a moment, by the way he handled me, that he was used to horses. He spoke gently, and his gray eye had a kindly, cheery look in it. It may seem strange to say, but it is true all the same, that the clean, fresh smell there was about him made me take to him. There was no smell of old beer and tobacco, which I hated, but a fresh smell as if he had come out of a hayloft. He offered twenty-three pounds for me but that was refused and he walked away. I looked after him, but he was gone and a very hard looking, loud voiced man came. I was dreadfully afraid he would have me, but he walked off. One or two more came who did not mean business. Then the hard faced man came back again and offered 23 pounds. A very close bargain was being driven for my salesman began to think he, he should not get all he asked and must come down. But just then the gray eyed man came back again I could not help reaching out my head toward him. He stroked my face kindly. Well, old chap, he said, I think we should suit each other. I'll give 24 for him. Say 25 and you shall have him. 2410, said my friend in a very decided tone and not another sixpence, yes or no. Done, said the salesman. And you may depend upon it, there's a monstrous deal of quality in that horse. And if you want him for cab work, he is a bargain. The money was paid on the spot, and my new master took my halter and led me out of the fair to an inn where he had a saddle and bridle ready. He gave me a good feed of oats and stood by while I ate it, talking to himself and talking to me. Half an hour after we were on our way to London, through pleasant lanes and country roads, he, until we came to the great London thoroughfare, on which we traveled steadily till in the twilight we reached the great city. The gas lamps were already lighted. There were streets to the right and streets to the left and streets crossing each other for mile upon mile. I thought we should never come to the end of them. At last we came to a long cab stand when my rider called out in a cheery voice, Good night, Governor. Hello, cried a voice. Have you got a good one? I think so, replied the owner. I wish you luck with him. Thank you, Governor, and he rode on. We soon turned up one of the side streets, and about halfway up that, we turned into a very narrow street with rather poor-looking houses on one side and what seemed to be coach houses and stables on the other. My owner pulled up at one of the houses and whistled. The door flew open, and a young woman, followed by a little girl and boy, ran out. There was a very lively greeting as my rider dismounted. Now then, Harry, my boy, open the gates, and Mother will bring us the lantern." The next minute, they were all standing round me in a small stable yard. Is he gentle, father? Yes, Dolly, as gentle as your own kitten. Come and pat him. At once, the little hand was patting about over my shoulder without fear. How good it felt. Let me get him a bran mash while you rub him down, said the mother. Do, Polly, it's just what he wants, and I know you've got a beautiful mash ready for him. Sausage dumpling and apple turnover, shouted the boy, which set them all laughing. I was led into a comfortable, clean-smelling stall with plenty of dry straw, and after a capital supper, I lay down, thinking I was going to be happy. Chapter 33. A London Cab Horse My new master's name was Jeremiah Barker, but as everyone called him Jerry, I shall do the same. Polly, his wife, was just as good a match as a man could have. She was a plump, trim, tidy little woman with smooth, dark hair, dark eyes, and a merry little mouth.
The boy was nearly 12 years old, a tall, frank, good-tempered lad, and little Dorothy, Dolly they called her, was her mother over again at eight years old. They were all wonderfully fond of each other. I never knew such a happy, merry family before or since. Jerry had a cab of his own and two horses which he drove and attended to himself. His other horse was a tall, white, rather large-boned animal called Captain. He was old now, but when he was young he must have been splendid. He had still a proud way of holding his head and arching his neck. In fact, he was a high-bred, fine-mannered, noble old horse, every inch of him. He told me that in his early youth he went to the Crimean War. He belonged to an officer in the cavalry and used to lead the regiment. I will tell more of that hereafter. The next morning when I was well-groomed, Polly and Dolly came into the yard to see me and make friends. Harry had been helping his father since the early morning and had stated his opinion that I should turn out a regular brick. Polly brought me a slice of apple and Dolly a piece of bread and made as much of me as if I had been the black beauty of olden time. It was a great treat to be petted again and talked to in a gentle voice, and I let them see as well as I could that I wished to be friendly. Polly thought I was very handsome and too good for a cab, if it was not for the broken knees. There's no one to tell us whose fault that was, said Jerry, and as long as I don't know, I shall give him the benefit of the doubt, for a firmer, neater stepper I never rode. We'll call him Jack, after the colonel, shall we, Polly? Do, she said, for I like the name. Captain went out in the cab all morning. Harry came in after school to feed me and give me water. In the afternoon, I was put into the cab. Jerry took as much pains to see if the collar and bridle fitted comfortably as if he had been John Manley over again. When the crupper was let out a hole or two, it all fitted well. There was no check rein, no curb, nothing but a plain ring snaffle. What a blessing that was! After driving through the side street, we came to a large cab stand where Jerry had said good night. On one side of this wide street were high houses with wonderful shop fronts, and on the other was an old church and churchyard surrounded by iron palisades. Along these iron rails, a number of cabs were drawn up waiting for passengers. Bits of hay were lying about on the ground. Some of the men were standing together talking, some were sitting on their boxes reading the newspapers, and one or two were feeding their horses with bits of hay and giving them a, dr a drink of water. We pulled up in the rank at the back of the last cab. Two or three men came round and began to look at me and pass their remarks. Very good for a funeral, said one. Too smart looking, said another, shaking his head in a very wise way. You'll find out something wrong one of these fine mornings or my name isn't Jones. Well, said Jerry pleasantly, I suppose I need not find it out till it finds me out, eh? And if so, I'll keep up my spirits a little longer. Then there came up a broad-faced man dressed in a gray, gray coat with gray capes and great white buttons, a gray hat, and a blue comforter tied loosely around his neck. His hair was gray, too, but he was a jolly-looking fellow, and the other men made way for him. He looked me all over as if he had been going to buy me, and then straightening himself with a grunt, he said, He's the right sort for you, Jerry. I don't care what you gave for him. He'll be worth it. Thus my character was established on the stand. This man's name was Grant, but he was called Gray Grant or Governor Grant. He had been the longest on that stand of any of the men, and he took it upon himself to settle matters and stop disputes. He was generally a good-humored, sensible man, but if his temper was a little out, it was as it was sometimes when he had drunk too much, nobody liked to come too near his fist, or he, for he could deal a very heavy blow. The first week of my life as a cab horse was trying. I had never been used to London, and the noise, the hurry, the crowds of horses, carts, and carriages that I had to make my way through made me feel anxious and harassed. But I soon found that I could trust my driver, and then I made myself easy and got used to it. Jerry was as good a driver as I had ever known, and what was better, he took as much thought for his horses as he did for himself. He soon found out that I was willing to work, and he never laid the whip on me unless it was gently drawing the end of it over my back when I was to go on. Generally, I knew this quite well by the way in which he took up the reins, and I believe his whip was more frequently struck up by his side than in his hand. In a short time, my master and I understood each other as well as horse and man can do. In the stable, he did all that he could for our comfort. The stalls were the old-fashioned style, too much on the slope, but he had two movable bars fixed across the back of our stalls so, then at, so that at night, when we were resting, he just took off our halters and put up the bars, and thus we could turn and stand whichever way we pleased. This is a great comfort. 
Jerry kept us very clean and gave us as much change of food, food as he could and always plenty of it. Excuse me while I move this. Not only that, but he always gave us plenty of fresh, clean water, which he allowed to stand by us both night and day, except, of course, when we came in warm. Some people like to say that a horse ought not to drink all he likes, but I know if we are allowed to drink when we want it, we drink only a little at a time, and it does it a great deal, and it does us a great deal more good than swallowing down half a bucketful at a time, because we have been left without it till we are thirsty and miserable. Some grooms will go home to their beers and leave us for hours with our dry hay and oats and nothing to moisten them. Then, of course, we gulp down too much at once, which helps to spoil our breathing and sometimes chills our stomachs. But the best thing that we had here was our Sundays for rest. We worked so hard in the week that I do not think we could have kept up to it but for that day. Besides, we had time to enjoy each other's company. It was on these days that I learned my companion's history. We'll stop there and start next time with chapter 34. Thanks. Bye-bye.